Did it turn off your mute? Mute. Okay, now we're fine. Hello, and welcome to this historic live stream to celebrate Paulo Freire's 100 years and more than 50 years since the publication of his seminal book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Uh, so rather than presenting papers in our typical fashion at research associations, this session presents us with an up close and intimate opportunity to get to know these incredible scholars through informal discussions. The discussants will, dis will talk about their relationships to Paulo uh, and his influence uh, followed by a short Q&A. Um, so to begin, this event brings together an esteemed panel of the most prominent and important figures in the furtherance of Paulo Freire's philosophy and evolution of critical pedagogy. Needless to say, Freire's transformative ideas even more relevant today is, are even more relevant today in our oppressive culture. This is evidenced in what Professor Giroux refers to as the rise of neo-fascism, resulting in the rapid increase of white nationalist movements globally. Such movements unabashedly reveal oppressions that are at the intersection of race, class, gender, sexual violence, and anti-immigration. Paulo Freire is recognized as one of the greatest thinkers in this and last century, in both education and the politics of liberation. While he is known mostly for his literacy campaigns in Latin America and Africa, his thinking continues to be rediscovered and evolved by generations of teachers, scholars, community activists, and cultural workers globally. According to noted pedagogue and scholar, friend of, and friend of Paulo, Stanley Aronowitz, he, called, he said that Freire's name is near iconic, declaring Freire as the Latin John Dewey and noting brilliant methodology and noting the brilliant methodology of his highly charged political character. El Maestro, as he was affectionately called in those days, presciently shared ways to comprehend our present crises and to challenge the ways that those in education must take a stand at the center of human rights and social justice. Today, the legacy of Freire's School of Thought provides us with comprehensive analyses related to the struggles against the forces of neoliberalism and neo-fascism, not just in education, but in all social life through radical democratization. Freire's work shows us how assaults on democracy can be fought and beaten. His work highlights how groups have successfully opposed the twisted forces and outlines the elements needed to build powerful mass movements to confront institutional fasc fascist ideas, to protect marginalized communities, and to ultimately stop current threats to our democracy. Framed this way provides analyses for decolonizing the mind and empowering oppressed communities, educators, laborers, political and solidarity activists, and struggles against oppression. Freire asks us this question. In response to Paulo's um, call to uh, action to stay ever vigilant. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. Sorry. Sorry. Hello. Hold on. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Hi, Antonia. Okay. I think I have to start. Off. Okay. Can really see you guys. Hello. Um, so we're going to. How are you doing? We're going to mute our, 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 see, I can't our hear. cameras. Can you hear me? Can yes. you hear me? You're going to have to mute your camera. Uh, your... Okay. I'm going to start over. Um, welcome to this historic live stream to celebrate Paulo Freire's 100 years and more than 50 years since the publication of his seminal book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. So rather than presenting papers, this session presents us with an up close and intimate opportunity to get to know these scholars through informal discussions. The discussants will talk about their relationship to Paulo and his influence and followed by a short Q&A. So to begin, this event brings together an esteemed panel of the most prominent and important figures in the furtherance of Paulo Freire's philosophy and the evolution of critical pedagogy. <laughs> needless to say, needless to say, Freire's transformative ideas 
are even more relevant today in our oppressive culture. This evidence, this is evidence in what Professor Giroux refers to as the rise of neo-fascism, resulting in the rapid increase of white nationalist movements globally. Such movements unabashedly reveal oppressions at the intersections of race, class, gender, sexual violence, and anti-immigration. Paulo Freire is recognized as one of the greatest thinkers in this and the last century in both education and the politics of liberation. While he is known mostly for his literacy campaigns in Latin America and Africa, his thinking continues to be rediscovered and evolved by generations of teachers, scholars, and community activists globally. According to noted critical pedagogue and friend of Paulo, Stanley Aronowitz, Freire's name is near iconic, declaring Freire as the Latin John Dewey and noting the brilliant methodology of his highly charged political character. El Maestro, as he is affectionately, was affectionately called in those days, presciently shared ways to comprehend our present crises and to challenge the ways that those in education must take a stand at the center of human rights and social justice. Today, the legacy of Freire's school of thought provides us with comprehensive analyses related to struggles against the forces of neoliberalism and neo-fascism not just in education, but in all social life through radical democratization. Freire's work shows us how assaults on democracy can be fought and beaten. His work highlights how groups have successfully opposed such twisted forces and outlines the elements needed to build powerful mass movements to confront institutionalized fascist ideas, protect marginalized communities, and to ultimately stop the current fascist threats to our democracy. Framed this way provides power analyses, he provides power analyses for decolonizing the mind and empowering oppressed communities, educators, laborers, political and solidarity activists in struggles against oppression. Freire asks us this question, why and how power and oppression plays out in our daily lives? In response, Paulo provides a call to action to stay ever vigilant to the looming political threats to democracy. In other words, we need to be awakened to the assault on dem democratic values and to the development uh, of pedagogies to counter these trends uh, while cultivating critical engagement and critical action. This divergent group of scholars, some of whom worked closely with Paolo, are widely recognized for their contribution to critical theory and critical pedagogy and are here today to share and bear witness to his legacy and the continued relevance of Paulo Freire. They carry on his work in their different scholarly projects calling for ethical and intersectional resistance. And therefore, it gives me, it gives me great pride to briefly introduce our panelists. And before they speak, I will talk a little bit more. Um, before we get started, the session will be recorded and hopefully edited and posted to this YouTube channel with a transcript of Nita Freire's talk. If you have any questions, please post them in the chat space and we'll get to as many as we can as time allows. Uh, please see the websites of the various scholars below uh, for more detailed uh, information on our presenters. So now it gives me great pleasure to introduce this panel. Nita Freire, scholar, educator, and wife uh, of the late Paulo Freire. Uh, Henry Giroux, one of the most influential living uh, public intellectuals today, AERA Fellow, Lifetime Achievement Award recipient. Antonia Darter, scholar, activist, artist, and recipient of the Paulo Freire Legacy Award in 2021. Donaldo Macedo, the inaugural, re inaugural recipient of the Paulo Freire Award. Uh, Peter McLaren, uh, co-director of the Paulo Freire Democratic Project at Chapman. University, and finally, the up and coming critical scholar, Ine Ascioli from the Fluminense Federal University in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And uh, as I said, you can look at their uh, websites below. Our first presenter is Anna Nita Freire, uh, the widow of uh, Paulo Freire. According to Donaldo Macedo, Nita uh, not only re inspired Paulo uh, to re unleash his indignation and rebelliousness in a more direct and accessible manner but she also influenced him to embrace a language that is more inviting, less dense, and more poetic. In essence, Macedo writes that the last 10 years of Paolo's life with Nita was by far the best window through which we can see what it meant to be in the world, with the world, and with others in the world. In her book, Situating Pedagogy of the Oppressed, 
Nita captures what is meant to be to, meant to live and work alongside Paolo uh, by providing readers with the opportunity to fully understand Paolo's insistence on viewing history as a constant possibility. Uh, Nita also co-authored uh, Pedagogy of Hope, Pedagogy of the Heart with Paolo and Chronicle of Love, My Life with Paolo Freire with Donaldo Macedo, among others. She is currently working on translating and publishing archival manuscripts of Paolo. Uh, we are therefore privileged to have Nita with us today. Uh, she has prepared um, a talk uh, presentation about her, her life with uh, Paolo in Portuguese. And uh, we will share her, um, her, the transcript of her talk uh, when we uh, publish the uh, recording. Welcome, Nita. Começo a falar? Bom dia a todas e a todos que estamos reunidos para homenagear Paulo Freire. Can you hear me? Good morning for, for everyone who are here today to honor Paulo Freire. Vocês conhecem Paulo mais pela pedagogia do oprimido. You know Paulo more through the pedagogy of the oppressed. Alguns de vocês como Antônia, Giru, Pita e, sobretudo, Donaldo, conheceram Paulo pessoalmente e muito de perto. Yeah. Some of you, uh, especially Giru, Antônia, Peter e Donaldo, uh, knew, had the privilege of knowing Paulo, not only through his work, but uh, very close personally. A Pedagogia do Oprimido é um livro, como já foi mencionado, é um dos livros mais lidos do mundo atualmente. Paulo está em segundo lugar em, em leitura dos livros de ciências sociais. Yeah. The Pedagogy of the Press is one of the most read book, you know, at this moment of world history. And... Uh, Paulo's book, Pedagogy de Press, you know, is the second most read book in social sciences. Embora eu conheça muito, muito a obra de Paulo, e ela me marcou profundamente durante toda a minha vida, durante toda a minha vida, não. Desde que eu me fiz adulta e os livros de Paulo começaram a sair, Hoje, eu não quero falar do Paulo intelectual, eu quero falar do Paulo como meu homem. Yeah. Uh, even though uh, I uh, was always marked by Paulo's work uh, uh, throughout my life, and then uh, she said throughout my adult life, when Paulo's book began to mark me, today, I don't want to talk about his published work, I'm going to talk uh, about Paulo as his man, as her man. <laughs> uh, this is a Portuguese expression, but it's, uh, in this case, you have the right to say that your man. Hoje, são passados 24 anos, quase um quarto de século, que Paulo morreu. Today, it's been 20, Mark's 24th birthday of his death, almost a quarter of a century. Mas eu tenho Paulo como uma presença viva em todos os momentos da minha vida. Nevertheless, I, I am constantly, Paulo is constantly present in all dimensions of my life, always. Durante os primeiros quatro anos depois que Paulo morreu, eu estava num luto tão pesado que parecia que Paulo tinha morrido fazia poucos dias. 
During the first four years, I was in very deep mourning that always I thought that Paulo had died just recently. Minha neta, meus filhos não, mas minha neta e muitos amigos começaram a dizer, Nita, você precisa se tratar, porque o período considerado normal de uma prostação tão grande pela perda de um ente querido é em torno de dois anos. E você já está há quatro anos sofrendo como se Paulo estivesse morrido hoje. Yeah. Uh, her granddaughter, not her kids, used to tell her during the four years that Nita should seek professional help to the degree the normal uh, passage of time to mourn someone who's so close to you is about two years. And uh, going on four years, she remained, you know, in deep mourning. Paulo fez o cateterismo e passou bem todo dia, mas no princípio da noite ele teve um infarto. E o hospital israelita, o Einstein, um dos grandes hospitais do mundo em cardiologia, o levou, veio imediatamente o quarto e o levou para a terapia intensiva. Paulo uh, uh, did cateterization, uh, but uh, you know it was not helpful. And then in a hospital that's extremely well known, not only in Brazil, but worldwide, you know, they took him to a special room where they intensively work on him, uh, but unfortunately, uh, he did not make it. A médica disse, eu vou conseguir uma, uma, um quarto de semi-intensivo, porque você pode dormir com o Paulo mas não conseguiu porque o hospital estava cheio, um hospital enorme, enorme, mais de um andar só de doentes cardiológicos. The uh, Paulo's uh, medical doctor assured Nita that uh, she was going to arrange for a semi-private room where Nita could have slept there that night, but the hospital was so uh, full that she was not able to do so. Eu fui para casa umas duas horas da manhã e fiquei muito preocupada. I went For... home at two in the morning and I was extremely worried. Forrei uma... um cobertor que estava muito frio e toda vestida, pronta, não tirei nem as botas, nem os sapatos, as botas, sapato. I, I, uh, it was cold, very cold in São Paulo that night. Uh, I covered myself with a blanket. I even went to bed completely dressed, including with my boots. É de... Sandali. I don't... Oh. De repente, eu não tenho contado isso, contei isso a muito poucas pessoas. De repente, assim, às cinco horas da manhã, eu vi Paulo como uma figura imensa, imensa, entrando no quarto e veio até mim e me abraçou. I, I never, I only... Uh, uh, shared this with a handful of people, but around five in the morning, I saw Paolo like a huge image, uh, you know, coming into the room, our bedroom, and then he hugged me profoundly. Eu me sentei de repente na cama e disse, eu acho que Paulo morreu. I said... I said, um pouco. Yeah. I sat on, on the bed and I said to myself, I think Paulo has died. You know, rest a little. Às 
seis e meia da manhã, a médica telefonou. E ela falava, falava, e eu dizia, doutora Maristela, eu não entendo nada do que você está falando. Yeah. The doctor called at 6.30 in the morning. She would talk, talk, talk. And uh, the response from Nita is that, uh, doctor, I don't understand anything that you're saying. De repente, eu disse, Paulo morreu? E ela me disse, sim. Suddenly, I asked her, and urgently, I said, did Paulo die? And the response was, yes. Foi como se uma espada entrasse em mim e me cortasse totalmente. Eu nunca tinha sentido uma dor tão grande em minha vida. Nunca tinha sentido. It was as if a huge knife penetrated my heart. Uh, I had never uh, experienced uh, this a pain so severe like Paulo's death. Me lembro que eu disse para ela, e o que eu faço de minha vida agora? Não tenho mais nada que fazer na vida. Não tenho. She told the doctor, what am I going to do with my life? I have nothing to do uh, with my life without the presence of Paulo. A minha sensação, o meu sentimento era isso, que a vida tinha acabado, que o mundo estava se acabando, que o mundo todo estava se acabando. My, my feeling at that moment is that my life had ended. In fact, the, the world was ending uh, and, and everything around the world was coming to an end as well. Os dias se passaram numa tremenda amargura, numa tremenda tristeza, numa tremenda vontade de morrer. The following days, you know, I felt this tremendous desire to die, this tremendous sadness, you know, and uh, I didn't want to continue to live. Quando eu comecei a trabalhar os textos de Paulo para fazer livros, começaram a me cobrar. E o primeiro deles foi Pedagogia da Indignação. Foi uma coisa de uma ambiguidade enorme, porque, ao mesmo tempo que me dava alegria, lendo aquelas coisas maravilhosas que Paulo escreveu nesse livro, eu sentia uma tristeza enorme de estar ali completando o livro que ele não teve tempo de terminar. When I began to work on his unpublished you know, work, the first one being the pedagogy of indignation, you know, I felt uh, I felt this tremendous joy of reading. Uh, uh, you know, his pronouncement, his ideas and ideals, at the same time, this incredible anguish and sadness, knowing that Paulo was not able to finish this book. Eu sempre acreditava, eu dizia para ele, vou fazer a sua festa de 100 anos, Paulo. I always e... believe that, and I used to say to him, I'm going to basically give you a, your centennial party. Porque Paulo tinha uma alegria de vida, uma energia de vida, uma vontade de viver e uma curiosidade tremenda. Yeah. Então, se dizia, os psicólogos diziam, isso é o necessário para se viver muitos anos. Uh, because uh, he, she thought he would live until at least 100 because he had this energy, the zeal to live, this wish to want to be alive, you know. So, uh, and then this joy of living that uh, she never considered him, you know, not alive. 
Paulo continua para mim, a cada minuto da vida, presente junto de mim. Paulo continua para ser uma constante presença every minute of my life. Tem muitas fotografias dele no meu quarto e toda hora eu entro lá. Quando eu entro, sempre falo com ele, digo alguma coisa. Yeah. Não? The, I have a lot of his photographs on the walls of, of my bedroom. And every time that I do go in, no matter what time, uh, I find something to talk to him. Uma vez eu disse a Paulo, Paulo, tu és muito melhor homem do que intelectual. One time I told Paulo, Paulo, you are much a better man than you are an intellectual. Os olhos dele batiam, brilhavam, ele me olhou com uma paixão enorme. Yeah. Disse isso uma das coisas mais bonitas, melhores que eu já ouvi na vida. Yeah. Uh, his eyes would, you know, be full of energy, you know, became brilliant. And he was so happy and told Nita, would passionately told Nita, you know, this is the best thing that I have heard in my life. Isso mostra a humildade de Paulo. This shows Paulo's humility. Ele não queria ser o maior intelectual do mundo, nunca se considerou o maior intelectual do mundo. He didn't want to be considered the best or the most well-known world intellectual. In fact, he never, he never entertained that idea. Então, eu conheci Paulo, eu tinha cinco anos de idade. Quando eu conheci Paulo, eu era cinco anos de idade. E eu acompanhei a vida dele toda. Ele foi para o exílio, ficou 15 anos, mais de 15 anos, e eu encontrei com ele e Elza no exílio, e eu estava com Raul. Nós encontramos um, um almoço em Genebra. Yeah. I uh, knew him since I was five, you know, and then he was exiled. Uh, then many years later, we had, uh, I, in, in, in Geneva, we had uh, a, a, a lunch, you know, extended lunch, Brazilian type of lunch. Uh, and Paulo was with, with Elsa at that time, and I was with my ex, my former husband, uh, Raul. My late husband, Raul. Yes. É. Nita, temos é dois minutos. Sim. É. é impossível você ter vivido um homem na sua plena maturidade um homem que se entregou totalmente ao amor. It, it, it's, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to have had a man that you meet, you know, in his total maturity as man, uh, that was able to, you know, abandon himself totally, you know, to love and to love someone as I was loved. Todo sábado e domingo ele me perguntava o que tu queres, Nita, que façamos juntos hoje? Every Saturday and Sunday he would ask, Nita, what would you like for us to do, you know, this weekend? Então, hoje eu choro por não tê-lo mais comigo, mas eu agradeço a Deus o dom que ele me deu de ter conhecido Paulo a vida inteira e ter sido a mulher que se entregou totalmente a ele e o recebeu totalmente 
para uma vida conjunta inigualável. Muito obrigada. Yeah. Uh, I, I, um, uh, today I feel tremendous sadness that he is not present, physically present, but I do think, thank God for having given me the opportunity to have had Paulo in my life, a man that totally, you know, uh, uh, you know dedicated his life to me, uh, abandoned himself, you know, in, in, in his love towards me. Uh, at the same time, I retributed, I responded by doing the same, by loving him unconditionally and totally and completely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nita, and thank you, Donaldo. Um, so uh, we will have some questions afterwards. We have a lot of people in the chat asking questions, so let's uh, keep moving so we have time. Uh, hold on, let's see. So our next presenter is Professor Henry Giroux, a distinguished scholar and cultural critic, a working class champion, the found, one of the founding uh, theorists of critical pedagogy. He holds the McMaster's Chair uh, for Scholarship and Public Interest um, at uh, McMaster's. Um, he met Paulo in the early 80s and will tell us about it. Um, Henry Giroux stands as one of the most influential public intellectuals today. Uh, he was noted as one of the top 50 modern thinkers in education from Piaget to the present by Routledge. Uh, he was also named one of the 12 Canadians changing the way we think by the Toronto Star. Giro proves that he is not simply an engaged intellectual, but an intellectual whose work has been dedicated to salvaging the public spheres within an inclusive uh, democracy. Um, his impact goes beyond the academy with regular publications in political venues such as Counterpoint and Truthout, he which he serves on the board of directors. He's also been interviewed by Julian Casablancas for Rolling Stone, uh, Russell Brandt's po po political podcast. It goes without saying that Giroux's legacy will be felt for generations to come. He calls on all academics and scholars to take action to develop democratic emancipatory projects that challenge neoliberalism's power, dominance, and oppression, and to defend democracy, democratic life, and the public sphere in these uncertain times. His most recent books are Race, Politics, and the Pandemic and Pandemic Pedagogy, Education in Time of Crisis, as well as uh, The American Nightmare Facing the Challenge of Fascism. I'm delighted to welcome Professor Giroux. And I will start by asking him if he can share with us how he met Paolo and how he came to agree on doing a book series in, uh, in, the, um, in cultural studies. Um, and also to talk about, uh, you know, how there's, you, he's only one of few theorists who's really consistently appropriated and expanded Paulo's notion of civic liter literacy and why this concept is so important to him and to us uh, today. Welcome, Professor Giroux. First, um, let me just say to Nita how moving that tribute to Paulo was. Um, I, I think it, it, it perfectly captures something about the fact that anyone who has known Paulo personally, it's, ha it's hard to occupy a space in which he is not present in some way. Um, and for those of us outside of, of Nita, of course, who knew Paulo intimately, uh, it, it's a space marked by enormous humility. It's a space marked by an attempt to push at the frontiers of the imagination. But I think that most importantly, it's a space in which civic courage and the ability to say no, to cause trouble, to in some way challenge the powers of oppression in ways in which you realize that that's not just simply a personal commitment, but a collective and political commitment makes an enormous imp impact on, on how we understand the world around us. I met Paolo in, in, in the early 1980s. I had just been denied tenure by the semi-fascist John Silber, who was the president of Boston University at the time and was purging the, uh, the left 
almost entirely from the, the ranks of Boston University faculty. Um, and, and, you know, to, to meet Paolo is, is an extraordinary experience because you do view him first as iconic. You know, you, I mean, this is a man who was in prison. This is a man who fought, liter developed literacy campaigns in the midst of a, a junta who was exiled for X number of years, uh, who then came back and, 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 of course, attempted to implement his politics even, even more so on a much wider scale. But the thing about Paolo that always struck me as enormously uplifting, if, if, if not moving, was not simply that he was inspirational, but the fact that he had a grasp of the totality of politics that didn't link knowing something to a way in which it was removed for the possibility for individual and collective struggle. He understood that. He understood that you had to make connections, that you had to link individual issues to much broader considerations. And hence, one of the things that people don't often talk about is that Paolo's understanding of, of, of education was not simply that education was a site of struggle, but that education was central to politics itself. But it was central to a politics that was both global, global and contextual. You had to understand the specificity of how politics worked within particular kinds of cultures, within particular settings, within particular historical and social formations. He's very keen on linking context, relationships, broader struggles, the specific understandings of what it meant to enable people to become literate. And when I, when I, when I say literate, and I'll go back to this in a minute, I don't, I don't mean literacy in the sense of understanding how a language works. I, I don't mean literate and being able to read critically. I, I'm talking about a notion of literacy that in some fundamental way recognized that if people were voiceless, they were powerless. And to be voiceless is in a sense not to have a sense of agency that enable one to recognize not only one's understanding self-reflectively of oneself, but of one's understanding of the world and the people around us. So literacy became both a political intervention in the sense of raising one's consciousness, but also an active intervention. It meant to be literate, was not only to understand the world, but actively to intervene in the world. And it seems to me that this is the great gift that power understood. He linked education to culture and to power. Ideas were meaningless without power. They had to be married to power. And they had to be married in some fundamental way to collective resistance. But I, but I, I think that when I first met Paolo, one of the things that we were enormously concerned about in the 1980s, and this was done in conjunction with my brother, Donaldo Macedo, we were concerned about creating an alternative space, a place where people could write, could publish, and in a sense, push again through a logic of opposition that recognized that education in some fundamental way was always linked to what Paolo called the project of freedom. It had a vision. It was a political project. And it seemed to me that one of the things that we did right off, of course, was we established a series in education and cultural studies and education and culture published by uh, 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 what was his name, Jim Bergen, whose publishing house was actually in his garage uh, and next to his house. Uh, and all of a sudden, we, we, were, we were basically, Paolo and I were writing introductions and we were offering an opportunity for people to publish uh, who hadn't published before, some of whom were on this panel. And it, and it seems to me that that was a great intervention on Paolo's part because it recognized that what he wanted to do was enlarge those spaces, alternative spaces, in which people could actually learn and intervene in the world. And so literacy for him became both an active narration. How does one narrate itself? How does one become more politically conscious? How does one take the question of subjectivity seriously? Because it seems to me we can't address a problem unless we can understand it and we can't change the structures that impress us unless we have some understanding of how consciousness and subjectivity works. So that for Paulo was a central issue that's often missed. And I, and I think the other issue that always was very moving for me with Paulo was his ability to, to mediate the language of critique and possibilities I've talked about, I've talked about many times with a sense that the future is open. History is open. It's open. It's not closed. I mean, we live at a time in which neo-fascist oppression operates off the assumption that hope is a liability and that depoliticization is a virtue. 
And of course, Paulo rejected both of these positions. Paulo was eminently concerned with a language, with providing the foundation for a language that basically has to be changed over time, although the ideas are central to what it means. He understood something about depoliticization, whether we're talking about the, the, the project of civic literacy and the civic re, recuperating the civic imagination. And he talked about something about the language of, he talked about what I call the politics of disposability. He understood that all of a sudden what we had in a neoliberal formation, which Paulo was one of the first to identify uh, with respect to education, one of the first. He understood that neoliberalism basically was the end point of a capitalism that ended in fascism. He knew that. And he was very smart about what that meant. And I think like Pierre Bourdieu and uh, a, a number of other people, I mean, he understood that you cannot talk about agency without talking about pedagogy. He understood that he understood the what I would call the pedagogical dimensions of struggle and that they had to be forged with the appropriate weapons to basically be able to take seriously the notion that education was central to politics. And so it, it seemed to me that all of those issues initially in my, with my my early meeting with Paulo became became evident. But I but I, I, I must say the the other thing that was very clear to me was when Paulo met Nita. Um, I knew Paulo after his first wife died, and Paulo was very disrupt, very dis very despairing, and was in a, in a very bad place. Um, and then one day, while we were we would we, we did many talks together, Paulo and I. Paulo started talking about love, <laughs> and, and he once and he once said to me, he said, Juru, he said, I, I, I can't give a talk without love. And all of a sudden I knew something had happened that was really quite remarkable in Paolo's life. And all of a sudden I realized that it's impossible to be a radical without love. And Paolo understood that. And for Paolo, it, given his relationship with Nita, opened up a new vista in Paolo's life, a new sense of possibility, a new sense of inspiration a new sense of solidarity, the linking of intimacy with politics, the notion that power is not something that's just out there, that it inhabits our lives in ways in which we touch each other, the ways in which we make love to each other, the ways in which we listen to music. And that was the musical moment in Paolo's life. In the last 10 years of his life, there is a melody that all of a sudden expands the horizons of politics. And I was always moved by that. I always felt that there was a deeper sense of being in the world for Paulo, and that Nita was the bedrock of that, both as a colleague and as a lover and as an intellectual and as a, another, another public intellectual in, in his life. So in ending, without talking about all the things that Paulo has contributed, because we all know this, in ending, I must say, I knew Paulo for 15 years. It was one of the most impressive one of the most moving and one of the most serious moments in my life. Everything I have learned from that point on in some way is indebted to Paulo. But it also re reflects another dimension of my life. I also met Donaldo Macedo in that period in my life. And we have been brothers for 40 years. And the three of us together was quite a storm. Wasn't it, Donaldo? Thank you. Thank you. I think you're the three amigos. Yeah. So uh, let me, uh, I was joking uh, the other day about getting this band back together because we haven't been together since uh, we celebrated Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed in 2018 uh, at, in New York. Um, so the next uh, guest is uh, Professor Antonia Darter. She's an internationally recognized scholar, critical feminist artist, poet, and activist. She holds the Levy Presidential Endowed Chair in Ethics and Moral Leadership at Loyola Marymount uh, University. And she's a professor emerita um, from University of Illinois. Uh, for more than 30 years, Professor Daughter's practice and scholarship have focused on political questions and ethical concerns linked to racism, class inequities, language rights and critical pedagogy, Latino education, uh, and social justice. More recently, her work has sought to articulate critical theory of leadership, 
uh, for social justice and community engagement, uh, as well as to theorize, as well as to theorize a pedagogy of beauty uh, in pursuit of liberatory practice in education. Not one to slow down. Yesterday, Professor Daughter organized a very successful International May Day celebration with artists, musicians, and political activists. It gives me great pleasure to introduce one of the trailblazing women in critical pedagogy, Antonia Darter. Thank you, Sheila. <laughs> Muito obrigada, Nita. <laughs> and um, thank you, Donaldo, for, for doing that interpretation. Um, I also want to, of course, say hello to Henry and Peter. Peter, I hope you're feeling better. Peter has been ill, had a serious scare there, and I'm really glad that you're here, <laughs> Peter. Um, any welcome. I'm glad, I'm glad you're here. Um, I, I just have a, you know, I have a few points to make. Um, I mean, for me, you know, it, it's hard to talk about uh, Paolo in a way that doesn't, um, that doesn't always feel so transformative and, and feel so absolute significant in my life. But um, I think what I was asked to, to, to think about, you know, what are the ways in which, or some of the issues that have had a, an impact on how I think about a uh, the question of love or the, and um, I, I can't really talk about, about this without really kind of remembering how significant pedagogy of the oppressed was in my life. And I think it's not, it's not, you know, a surprise that it would have been, um, that it, it is one of, you know, of the most read books in education, that it is a, a um, a treatise that continues despite fascism, despite um, the, the kind of authoritarianism that um, we're facing in societies and also within schools with respect to neoliberal policies that continue to um, be predators uh, on the lives of teachers and students alike. That Paolo's book, Pedagogy of the Press, was really the first educational text um, that I found, where I found the concept of love explicitly put there, presented. And he spoke of it, you know, in relationship to our human vocation. And Henry's right, you know, probably all the things that I'm gonna say, you all already know. But for me, they continue to be part of, of the living force that Paulo is in, in my own understanding of the world. Uh, and, and so they, they're important to me and I hope they won't be so terribly um, repetitive to all of you who are here today. Um, the book was an important book um, in that, you know, it actually expressed the oppression or the condition of colonization that I, as a, as a Boricua woman, um, experienced. And it did it explicitly in respect to the oppressed and the, uh, the oppressed and the oppressor. And there's this tremendous feeling of connection um, that I and students that, that, that I've worked with and other comrades that we've experienced when we read a text that speaks to all that has been silenced or that was silenced during um, our process of schooling. So through, through Paolo's work, I and so many others discovered for the first time an educational language, this incredible, powerful political language um, that we also, you know, garnered in reading, you know, um, Henry's work and Donaldo's work and others' work, but particularly Paolo's work um, that made sense to us. It had meaning for us and it had meaning for me as an impoverished working class Puerto Rican woman who had felt so deeply alienated from the majority of all the academic books that I was expected to read in the course of my education. The way that then I, I've come to understand um, the, why that was so meaningful for me was that Paolo's expression of the world through his writing spoke of this epistemology that often is called now epistemology of the South, this early decolonizing epistemology that moved beyond the stifled discourse of Western thinking, where the dialectical and even the analectical uh, dimensions of life were expressed in ways that made sense for me and for others. 
you know, I found Paolo's pedagogy of love imbued with this decolonizing sensibility that directly linked material conditions of oppression to the brutal impact of cultural invasion that have been imposed on the lives of the oppressed. This is important in that often left unacknowledged is Freire's distinct cultural origins, fully situated within both an early 20th century colonizing context of Latin America and this early Southern epistemological formation that defies what Buaventura de Sousa Santos calls this abyssal divide. And we were always hitting across, hitting upon that abyssal divide, this divide so characteristic of Eurocentric epistemicides where hard analytical boundaries prevail between how this or that is defined and regulated, collapsing the very dialectics of our human existence. So within such restrictions and you know, there's this inability to grasp epistemologically the paradoxical rationality that Paolo brought often, you know, it, I, I see it, I think it's one of the reasons people always wanna make Paolo into a method because that's an easier way to understand, but his approach is so in, a, in opposition to narrow Aristotelian logic of the West from which, you know, that assumes that A and non-A somehow cannot exist together. So reading Freire had this powerful impact on my decolonizing struggles as it had an impact on the collective decolonizing struggles of so many of my working class comrades of color to overcome the stifling conditions, um, conditioned sense of our intellectual inadequacy and our deficiency that we experience within the patriarchal, uh, imperialist and racializing discourses of our educational formation prior to that moment that I came across pedagogy of the oppressed. Paolo's pedagogy of love for me communicated in no uncertain terms that our lives and our perspectives about our own circumstances were an important form of knowledge, which had to be part of the greater struggle for our liberation. In other words, our voices and our resistance had to be central to our empowerment and the larger collective struggle. It was then from reading Paolo's works that I began to understand more fully his meaning of love as a political force. In a variety of his writings, the concept of love, it resurfaces and reverberates in different ways. He insists that we are unable to enter into dialogue without love. The capacity to become literate, for example, I believe is really grounded in this human love and desire for knowing the world, which Paolo understood so intimately. In my own teaching, I took this principle of, of Paolo's pedagogy of love to heart. It is a love that it keeps bringing us back to the table. Paolo wrote somewhere that we had to be willing to try, you know, a thousand times. In other words, not to give up on our students, not to give up in relationship to the struggles in communities. In other words, our work as educators requires the kind of love that allows us to enter into solidarity with our students and our comrades. Their ability to develop knowledge and the ability of all of us to develop knowledge, to find our voices, to participate politically is grounded fundamentally in a loving connection with one another. It is this key dimension that is often absent in pedagogical efforts. And even when people try to talk about questions of education on the left, Paolo didn't have that reticence in any way, shape or form. That is, we all have, we all have you know, may have the theoretical or political press to present to students or comrades and communities. But if we lack the humility that um, that Henry was was referring to, and that this generosity of spirit that is born of love, it's impossible for us to enter into struggle in ways that he, that are humanizing and transformative. Unfortunately, the deep masculinity and authoritarian nature of even left discourses of the past and still present 
have been tremendously destructive, particularly to women and folks of color when we have been humiliated in our inexperienced efforts to name our own reality. So for many of us to continue the work, we had to just keep pushing and keep push, pushing against those boundaries. And the love that, that Paolo expressed in his work and in his relationship with many of us was important in terms of nurturing our capacity to persevere. So for those of us whose epistemological sensibilities were more deeply anchored in the South, Paulo's work encompassed a different cultural essence, a sensibility and a way of knowing the world, one that uncompromisingly acknowledged and spoke to the pain and suffering that steals from the oppressed our time, our space, and our place to exist freely, forcing us constantly to conform in subtle and not so subtle ways even within contexts on the left, where so often our espoused liberation is expressed as central to the struggle. Paolo's great humanity, I mean, I, I, I'm sure you'll hear it from, from others. I know you'll hear it also from Donado as you heard it you know, from, from Henry, it was, it was expressed over and over again in his writings. It was an acted in his everyday life as Nita so well has, attempted in, in every time she speaks to make clearly known that his embodied praxis was another important point of understanding what he meant by love as our vocation. Here, I, I look upon the ways in which Paolo enacted his pedagogy of love, his capacity to speak with people, no matter who they were, they didn't have to be well educated to merit his respect or his attention. As such, I came to understand that Paolo's pedagogy of love was not only about the capacity to name the conditions that we're facing, which is absolutely necessary and important, but also the ability to find collectively through relationships of loving solidarity, the sense of personal and communal empowerment and self-determination to denounce injustice, brutality, and suffering, while also embodying a love for humanity and the world in ways that could help us remain ever loyal to humanist, socialist sensibility, where people always come first. Another key issue of, of, um, of Paolo's pedagogy of love for me was, that was significant, um, is this idea that we, society, history, are forever unfinished, or as Henry speaks, you know, the openness of history. In other words, we are always, all of these are open for transformation. This is powerful for me, this is a powerful, question when so often we can feel so oppressed and not know exactly, you know, how the hell we're going to find another way to do things. This is not only about then the material realities that are constantly in a state of change, but in our lives and in the world, but about how both epistemologically and ontologically we understand the nature of our existence and how we make meaning of the conditions that we find in our lives. In Paolo's Pedagogy of Love, I found values that invigorated our social agency within both our relationships with students and, and in our communities and how we engage intimately and openly in schools and society. This was informed by the ways in which the political force of love supports us in an acting curiosity, imagination, and a sense of childlike wonder. Because that's one thing that Paulo always seemed to be able to express, a kind of childlike wonder, as if, as if he was learning something always for the first time within our very serious critical pedagogical processes. In so many ways, I've always felt that Paulo's notion of unfinishedness can continue to support us today. And it does continue to support us in embracing new beginnings. So from his readings I, and writings, I gained such a sense of Paolo's deep, deep love for knowledge, for learning, for teaching, for people in the world. And beyond these loving relationships with life, his willingness to engage life as he found it and his deep commitment to liberation, he invited us to also engage with life as an adventure, so we might not be silenced by the disquieting questions that often frighten us or expose our contradictions. Paolo's notion of love spoke to such a vital political force of encounter, which inspires solidarity and serves as an essential ingredient to our integrity and coherence in our labor as revolutionary educators. Finally, uh, Paolo's beautiful- finish, finish, go ahead. 
Sorry. Okay. <laughs> yeah, this is it. So, you know, Paolo's this beautiful embodied tenderness, good humor and capacity to laugh also provides us such an example for building together. And for me, it was always there, this transformational and humanizing politics of education. So I believe that Paolo recognized that it was through this embodied tenderness that human beings generate a sense of hope and possibility and our ability to dream individually and collectively. He continued, you know, uh, I just, so much of, of how he engaged the sense of beginning anew, this indel indelibly marked by both disquieting and disturbing uncertainties and attentive presence provoking us to both ask new questions and to be renewed. And in all of this, Pablo's pedagogy of love remains firmly embedded in my consciousness as a formidable anecdote for despair and powerlessness. It's a living pedagogy that can sustain us personally, politically, and pedagogically to, preserve, to persevere in our revolutionary collective struggle against the ravages of global capitalism. Thank you so much, Professor Dorder. I think in the future, we can do some individual interviews so that people can have a longer period of time. I feel like we're pressuring people to finish sooner than they're ready, so my apologies. Um, Let's uh, see, uh, our next uh, guest is um, uh, Distinguished Professor uh, Emeritus uh, of Linguistics at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. We heard from uh, Professor uh, Mercedo earlier. Um, he is a critical theorist, a noted linguist, and an expert on critical literacy um, and uh, educational studies. He, his work with Paulo Freire broke new theoretical grounds as it helped to develop critical understanding of the ways in which language, power, and culture contributed to the positioning and formation of human experience. Macedo was uh, Paulo Freire's chief translator and English language interpreter. He's published uh, dialogues with uh, Paulo, and these are considered classic works, not just for their elucidation of Freire's theories of literacy, but also for advancing critical and theoretical dimensions uh, in the study of literacy and critical pedagogy. Uh, he co-authored a book uh, with uh, Freire, Literacy, Reading the World and the Word, and it's central to critical literacy in that it redefines the very nature and terrain of literacy and critical pedagogy. I'm delighted to uh, introduce uh, Donaldo uh, as a, one of the first generation critical pedagogues on our panel with, uh, uh, with the others. And uh, we'd like to ask him, uh, how does Paolo's idea, uh, uh, ideas and his ideology continue to influence you? You have to unmute. How about this? There you go. Okay. Thank you very much, Sheila, first for the invitation and also to be part of this great um, discussion. And I never really wanted to, to follow Henry, Antonia, and Nita, but, uh, but I'm going to do my best. But Henry, in a sense, gave, gave me uh, a, neat, a segue in what I'm going to talk about. I would not have met Paolo if it had not been from Henry. So thus, to me, my connection to Paolo, the work that, I've, that I did with Paolo, uh, was a collective work that was necessary at that moment in history, particularly with the launching of the series, from which I benefited because literacy, uh, 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 reading the world and the world was one of the first books that got published by Bergen Gavi in that series. So Henry is fundamental as Paolo had been as fundamental in my transformation. And, uh, and you can't, you know, I'm gonna talk also about love. You can't ignore, if you know Paolo, if you knew Nita, if you had the privilege uh, to saw uh, uh, what love meant and how it can be practiced on a daily basis, uh, then uh, Paolo is everything that Antonio just shared with us. I notice, as Henry did, through the voice um, when Paolo fell in love, although he did not say that to me, I was in Sao Paulo, he invited me to have lunch uh, with, uh, with uh, this, a friend, he said, Nita Freire, 
And then, you know, it was the three of us. And then I was going to sit next to him. And all of a sudden, he sort of ushered me away from him and pulled Nita to his side. I don't know if Nita remember that, you know. But then I didn't really make much of it other than the joy, the child in him, the playfulness, the happiness, his eyes dancing, you know, and all of these things. I began to wonder, but he had not said anything to me. And I talked to him every week. So towards the, right before dessert, Neat was sitting next to him to the right. And I saw Paolo's hand moving slowly and touching Nita's hand. <laughs> I didn't know what to say, but I said, how wonderful. I was going through really uh, not a pleasant divorce at that time. Then I, 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 I did not, not know much about hope because those moments are not too helpful. But it did give me the possibility uh, that uh, uh, I needed to hope. I need to move on. And it made a difference because when I returned to the United States, it became very clear that I had to move out you know, a few months later. But this notion about love, it was one of the last conversations that I had with him as we were walking through the, the uh, Fifth Avenue in New York and I didn't see him. We were supposed to go, have gone to Cuba in, in a few months, but he died unfortunately before that happened. But he stopped me and he told me what uh, people don't un understand uh, is that it is always possible to love again. And that that moment I reconnect, you know, to what he did not say, but he acted in holding Nita's hand in a, such a lovely, you know, engagement that uh, was not a sexual moment, but it was a sensuous you know, moment. So this is how I'm going to structure uh, my tiny talk. And just to reiterate that it is indeed a pleasure uh, uh, and great honor for me to join my distinguished colleagues in the Zoom space to discuss the continued influence that Paulo has had on all of us, you know, and to humbly reinvent him in a way that he always insisted you know, I have, I probably heard that from Paolo so many times when he was asked, he was asked about his pedagogy, uh, um, uh, would it work, you know, in developed countries, and, that, and, and, and he would say, don't import me, reinvent me. Uh, and, and, and I wanted to make a parenthesis, since what in the context of love, what, the, you know, Henry has said, Nita has said, Antonio has said, uh, Bell Hooks in that moment also told me once, because Paulo's been critiqued given the Portuguese language was highly sexist and that is the language that he used, that by the way, he refused to have that change because he wanted people to continue to know of his evolution and his critical awareness about where he was at at that moment. Bell told me clearly in Boston over dinner, he, she said to me, what the fem American feminists don't understand, what Paulo Freire taught me, they have never done so. In other words, I have learned so much more from Paulo because as a woman who's black and oppressed, as a woman from the South, so to speak, as a woman, like Antonia said, you know, there was basically a texture to Paulo's ability, you know, to, to in his fluidity, to cross borders that talk to you in a very in, in, incredible way that in a competitive capitalist structure, you know, uh, uh, Bell did not get that support from, uh, from quote unquote, you know, sisters in the movement, you know. So for me, Paolo then uh, taught me from the very early meeting with, with, with Henry, uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with Paolo, with Stanley Runwitz, and a number of other people that uh, I cannot transform the world unless first I transform myself in my journey towards becoming. So there's a huge distinction that I think is often ignored, but it's important to make the difference that Paolo makes between to be and to become. 
what's very important for us is to understand that to become, you know, then springs from that possibility, the language of possibility, that hope that we can transform, we can change, and uh, including the oppressors have the opportunity to do so, but a choice uh, to do or not to do. So he constantly argued, in my view, you know, my discussion where to translate this this way or that way, uh, to make it more colloquial in English, that while we are, and we cannot deny that we are, transformation can only take place through becoming, which is a process that must be guided by the critical awareness of our unfinishedness, as mentioned before, which in turn must be guided uh, by a hope that's birthed in the very becoming process. In other words, our nature of being more, but being more is often not understood because Paolo's notion of being more is becoming more as an expansion of our humanity. So because to be more as human requires humility, which he had an abundance uh, uh, of, Paolo also challenged us to contain the instinctual impulse, impulses to have more. We, in a capitalist structure, we often and also conveniently confuse the two. To have more that can lead, for example, to a form of crass careerism, a socially construct careerism that trumps to be in the world and with the world. For me then, consequently, educators must always view the day intervention in the world as a mission, not as a careerism, as a mission that humanize rather than a career in pursuit of substitution of power through the manipulation of the existing structure for that they do not on one hand, but they benefit from the other, it, within which power is appropriated rather than reinvented. Power appropriation under the rubric of criticity speaks for the oppressed while power reinvention, as Paolo you know, uh, uh, proposed to us, dial may, allows us to dialogue with the very people in the process of conscientization. So then power appropriation through crass networking that we often witness gives rise to critical pedagogy hustlers, while power reinvention points to a humanizing path through which the submerged voices emerge to denounce the humanity inherent in all forms of oppression. You can add all the ism to that, uh, that, that, uh, that phrase. So power reinvention enables the oppressed to chart along with us their own course in the announcement of a less cruel and a more humane world. Simply put, a critical posture in the world and also in schools must be always animated, animated by coherence, a necessary walk in the talk, which basically is not always the case. So for me then without coherence, it is oxymoronic to denounce the miseducation, the inequality, the injustice, the very injustice that sustains the latter. To end my presentation, while Paolo is not with us today, as Nita said, Henry said, Antonia said, the, in the, uh, today, his presence through his ideas and ideals continue, continues to guide me away from the seduction, from the seduction of speaking for the oppressed, you know, as I adhere to his teaching that critical reflection is not enough. Critical reflection in his, in his view, what I learned from, from his teachings must be followed by action that are transformative, actions that are steeped in love for humanity through hope, which always brings us a step closer to our complete completeness you know, in our journey, uh, uh, journey to be more. Thus, the language of love points always to the possibility 
<coughs> when the ugliness inherent in oppression, as Paulo insightfully wrote, I quote, uma moralidade indispensável, unquote, an indispensable mora morality. That is language, the language of love unleashes hope in Paulo's view and also in mine and in us, I guess, all of us, for a more beautiful world. The language of love is a model, it is a natical, it is also a political act that gives substantivity what it means to be fully human. Human, and I let me just end because he said said it so much better that all of us can say. He said the language of love, in the language to create the love of love. I quote: We need to have faith in the creation of a world <laughs> where it is less difficult to love. Unquote. Obrigado. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Macedo. Thank you very much. Um, we really appreciate it. So uh, the next speaker we have is uh, Professor Peter McLaren, uh, distinguished professor in critical studies and co-director of the International uh, uh, Global Ethics and um, uh, Social Justice Center. He also is the um, the, one of the co-founders of the Paulo Freire Democratic Project at Chapman University. He's written numerous texts and edited uh, texts uh, uh, about Paulo. His classic work, Life in Schools, was based on a diary McLaren kept as a classroom teacher in the inner city in Toronto. Um, he is with us today and uh, he is going to talk about the role that spirituality played in Paulo's work and his relationship uh, to the Catholic Church and how it reflects on the role uh, purpose of religion or spirituality in today's world. Welcome, Professor McLaren. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you, Sheila, for this fantastic um, event and for all the hard work that, uh, that you've done in putting this together. Thank you. Paulo uh, has addressed um, the role of theologians and the church in, in his writings. Um, he's examined its formalism, its fictitious neutrality and captivity in a complex web of bureaucratic rights that pretends to serve the oppressed, but actually supports the ruling class. For Paulo, critical conscious uh, consciousness cannot be divorced from Christian consciousness. Paulo's attack on bourgeois subjective idealism as what he called naive consciousness approaches the transformation of consciousness as a political act. To speak a true word according to Paulo is to transform the world and I'm sure you've heard that phrase over and over uh, in writings uh, about Apollo. The ruling class from Paulo's perspective views consciousness as something that can be transformed by lessons, lectures, and eloquent sermons. But in this instance, consciousness is essentially static, what Paulo described as necrophilic or death loving, as distinct from biophilic or life loving. loving and constitutes an uncritical adherence to the ruling class and serves as a means of emptying critical consciousness of its dialectical content. So Paulo calls for the bourgeoisie to take on a new apprenticeship of dying to their own class interests and experiencing their own Easter moment through a form of mutual understanding and transcendence. Paulo argues that the theologians of Latin America must move forward and transform the dominant class interests in the interests of the suffering poor. If they are to experience death as an oppressed class and to be born again to liberation or else they will be implicated within a church which forbids itself the Easter which, it's, which it preaches. Paulo borrowed the concept of class suicide from Amilcar Cabral, the Guinea-Bissauian and Cape Verdean revolutionary and political leader 
who was assassinated in 1973. And for Paulo, insight into the conditions of social injustice of this world stipulates that the privileged must commit a type of class suicide where they self-consciously attempt to divest themselves of their power and privilege and willingly commit themselves to unlearning their attachment to their own self-interest. Essentially, this was a type of Easter experience in which a person willingly sacrifices his or her middle class or ruling class interests in order to be reborn through a personal commitment to suffering alongside the poor. Of course, this class suicide takes place in a context of a larger mission to end the social sin of poverty itself. It is a transformational process in which a person identifies with the poor and the oppressed and commits oneself to taking down all victims from the cross. Here we find an echo of the teachings of St. Francis. Both Paulo and St. Francis understood that a transcendence of oppression, a striving upwards in the struggle for liberation was not enough. Transcendence is not enough. As Leonardo Boff notes in his study of St. Francis, a striving upwards away from the travails of the world through the attainment of some kind of mystical consciousness is not enough, it's insufficient. What is also needed, and even more so, is, a, is what Boff called a transdescendence. We have to descend as well as transcend. Transdescendence refers to an act of self-emptying, an openness to the lives of those below, the poor, the stigmatized, the despised, and a willingness to integrate them into a community of love, of kindness and solidarity, a fraternal solidarity with those suffering from the scourge of life's deprivations. Christ encountered such trans, trans descendants in the wretched of the earth, in the crucified of history. Now, I want to uh, quote Nita Freddy, uh, who did an amazing interview with a friend of mine, James Kirlo, a wonderful Frarian scholar, uh, and Nita wrote this. Paula was a man of authentic faith and believed in God. And while he was Catholic, he was not caught up in the religiosity of his faith. He believed in Jesus Christ and in his kindness, wisdom, and goodness. He did, however, have grave concerns with the church, particularly the contradictions of its actions and the actions of its priests. For example, he observed since his childhood how so many priests ate well and gained weight, yet the poor remained poor and hungry, only to hear the priests say to them, well, don't worry, God is with you and your reward is great in heaven. For Paulo, many priests with their bellies full did not have authentic compassion and empathy for the poor and were not consistent with what they had said and what they did. Nita also mentions Paul's work on the distinctions among the church. And she notes that, and I'm quoting Nita here, when Gustavo Gutierrez invited Paulo to work on some components related to liberation theology, Paulo began to analyze the distinct differences among what he called the traditional church, the modern church, and the prophetic church. The prophetic church is one that gives witness and is a liberated church, one that feels with you, one that is in solidarity with you, with all the oppressed in the world, the exploited ones, and ones that are victimized by capitalist society. And then to conclude, given Nita's insights, the most significant aspect of Paulo's work on the different roles of the church, at least as it pertains to the context of revolutionary critical pedagogy, developed in my work would be what Paulo refers to as the prophetic church. This captures much of the spirit of Jose Porfirio Miranda's work on liberation theology and the work of other theologians of liberation like John Sobrino, Leonardo Boff, Gustavo Gutierrez, and James Cohn, and many others. Thank you.
Thank you, Professor McLaren. Um, if anybody is really interested in uh, liberation theology, I direct you to Paula's work and Peter's uh, uh, book on, um, on theology and, and the Catholic Church, right? Um, so we have our next speaker and then we'll have some questions. We have actually, what's really exciting is we have people from um, all over the globe. Uh, we have people from Ireland, from Turkey. Uh, let me see, where else do we have people from? Um, uh, Thailand, Canada, Brazil, Indonesia. Uh, we welcome you all and thank you. And this will be recorded for our friends down under who wrote to me telling me that this is happening in the middle of the night <laughs> in Australia and in China and Japan. So we will record it and we'll post it on this uh, website. So our next, uh, our next speaker uh, is, um, is Professor, she's an up and coming critical pedagogue. Uh, it, her name is uh, Professor Annie Asioli and she's a professor of education at Fluminense Federal University in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Uh, she's currently editing a book with Professor Maceda entitled Education, Equality, and Justice in the New Normal Globe and Global Responses to the Pandemic with Bloomsbury London. Dr. Ascioli will speak to the erasure of Paulo Freire in Brazil today. Uh, incredibly, uh, and incredible as it sounds, Paulo Freire, who was hailed as the patron of education of Brazil, is being vilified by the Brazilian ultra-conservative government and has, which has outlawed his teaching and philosophies. In fact, teachers are penalized now for using his text. It goes without question that Freire's humanistic approach to help the oppressed and women, men, and women and men to overcome the powerlessness by acting on their own behalf through his principles of social justice, equity, access, and participation in human rights is absolutely so relevant today. So I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Asioli. Thank you, Sheila. I feel extremely happy and honored to be here celebrating Paulo Freire. I see on YouTube there are many comrades from Argentina, South Africa, Denmark, Turkey, India, Thailand, Indonesia, Hungary. And I see many, many comrades from Brazil. And in Brazil, we are facing, I think, the darkest time in our recent history. And I say our recent history because the Brazilian history is history of colonization, of genocide, genocide of the indigenous people, genocide of black youth in the favelas. But we Brazilians, nós brasileiros, we are people with a history of struggle of resistance. Our history is marked by warriors who fought against colonization, against slavery, against exploitation. Our ancestors are indigenous communities, quilombos communities. They are still fighting against, very bravely, fighting against the capitalist mode of production and the destruction of nature and of life. Paulo Freire is part of our history. Paulo Freire é parte da nossa história. Freire represents those one who refused to be dehumanized. And the coronavirus pandemic in Brazil, more than 400,000 people have died from coronavirus. 20,000 deaths per week. Around 3,000 Brazilians lose their lives every day. This is a real genocide. And Paulo Freire represents those ones who refuse to look at the death toll, pretending that it's just numbers, because the numbers are human beings who might not have died if there wasn't a genocidal president who refused to buy vaccines, a president who laughs and says, using these words, stop all this fussing and whining. How long are you going to keep on crying? Freire inspires us to rise up against the fascist, against the racist. Freire inspires teachers who are on strike 
for life. Because understand that schools are spaces of life and not spaces to spread death. Freight inspires the teachers who refuse the normality that the elite imposes on us. There is no normality and it's not possible to teach and learn and pretending that nothing is going on. Yeah. Freight is part of our history as Brazilians. Freight learned to read, to read the world in Northeastern Brazil. In the early 20th century, he experienced deep inequality, oppression, hunger. Hunger is the elite's violence against the people. And today we are in the third decade of the 21st century and around 19 million Brazilians are going hungry. More than half of the population faces some level of food insecurity. There are more people suffering from hunger in Brazil than the sum of the populations of Denmark, Finland, and Norway. Freire is alive in each of us. Freire vive em cada um de nós. Freire is alive in each of us who denounce, who fight against the genocide against exploitation, against racism, xenophobia, gender-based violence. Freire is alive in each of us who dare to love, who dare to dream and fight for a more equal and human war. Paulo Freire, presente. Fora Bolsonaro. Thank you, Dr. Astioli. Thank you very much. That was lovely. Um, so we have some time for some questions, and I will direct uh, the question. Uh, the first question is to Nita. Um, we have uh, uh, Hassan Aksko, who asks if um, Paulo ever met Augusto Boala, uh, the, uh, uh, who uh, started the Theater of the Oppressed, and if not, how would he react to his, uh, his work? You have to unmute. Nita, você entendeu? Nita, me ouve? Nita, você entendeu a minha pergunta? You have to unmute. Sheila, you should be able to unmute her. Uh, de giga. <laughs> yeah, já, já deu. Se você entendeu a pergunta. Não, para mim. Não, a pergunta foi se o Paulo Freire teve o prazer de conhecer Augusto Boal, que trabalhava sobre o teatro do, do oprimido. Sim, Augusto Boal partiu para compor o teatro oprimido a partir do livro de Paulo. Yeah. Uh, Augusto Boal, you know, began his work in the theater of the oppressed uh, uh, from the perspective of Paulo's book, you know, the pedagogy of the oppressed. Quando ele foi, Augusto Boal foi vereador pelo Rio de Janeiro, deu o prêmio a Paulo de, de Pedro Ernesto. Yeah. When, when, when Augusto Boal was a politician uh, at La Sora City Council in Rio de Janeiro, he gave him, you know, a major uh, uh, award. Sim. Os dois receberam o prêmio de Dr. Honoris Causa em Omaha. Yeah. Paulo e Boal, yeah. os dois yeah. juntos. Both, uh, both Paulo Freire and Augusto Boal Receive you know, honoris causa doctorate from the University of Omaha, you know, uh, in the United Conversaram States. Conversaram algumas vezes. Eram amigos, sim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They talked sometimes. Uh, they were uh, they were friends. 
but did I remember also uh, you and Paolo went to dinner of his house once in, in Rio, right? Do you remember? Nita, você, você não se lembra de uma vez que você foi para a casa do, do, do Augusto e o, e o Paulo? Sim, sim, fomos. Sim, sim. Você estava so, junto? É. Você... Não, não sei, mas você, o Paulo me contou. Ah, sim. Yeah. É, fomos. Uh, Ele nos convidou para um jantar, fez um... Yeah. Um yeah. Jantar. Augusto Boal had uh, invited Nita and Paulo for a dinner of his house in Rio de Janeiro. And uh, the dinner was so memorable that uh, Paulo had uh, mentioned that occasion to me. So I was just reminding Nita of that fact. <clears throat> Next question. Sheila. I think. Sheila, unmute. Unmute. Oh, God almighty, it's me. Okay. <laughs> we have a question for Henry, uh, several questions for Henry, one from Indonesia that asks about how uh, uh, Paulo's theory and your philosophy uh, and can inspire us to concretely fight fascism. Well, I think the first, thing, sorry, I think the first thing about fascism is you have to recognize what it is. And it seems to me that uh, in some fundamental way that we have to recognize that people are often seduced into a fascist logic because fascism begins with language. It begins with questions of consciousness and subjectivity. It begins with lies. It begins, with, it begins with diverting issues away from real issues in ways that suggest that the crisis of politics cannot be separated from the crisis of consciousness and the, con and the crisis of pedagogy. And so I, I, th I think in many ways, what we're talking about here is that by uh, enabling people to adopt or creating the conditions for people to adopt a critical stance and develop a critical consciousness, it becomes significant in terms of what it means to both understand and to resist fascism, not simply as an economic and political force, but also as an educational force. I mean, I, I think as, as uh, Innie has pointed out with respect to Brazil, one of the things that's going on in the world today is this pandemic crisis has really, really created a political crisis of enormous, in which enormous forms of oppression are at work, violating civil liberties, expanding inequalities, uh, diverting issues away from real issues, making the claim that neoliberal capitalism is not a form of fascism, it's really about in, in some way punishing immigrants, punishing people of color, increasing the punishing state, collapsing the social state. And it seems to me that we need a language that both identifies these issues and at the same time offers a comprehensive politics in which matters of resistance are no longer simply about uh, being told that the problems we face are individual problems or that the problems we face are basically problems caused by people who are seen as other, people who are part of, are marginalized by questions of race, class, gender, and sexual orientation. So critical pedagogy is crucial. It's crucial as a way of taking consciousness seriously. It's crucial as a way of understanding the role of subjectivity as part of the fundamental politics of domination. And it's crucial in terms of offering ways in which we can begin to talk to each other through protective spaces in which education is central to politics itself. Um, you write about um, uh, Arendt's uh, dark times. Um, there's a real resurgence of nationalism now. And, uh, you know, we talk about the um, ill democracy and Hungary and Sweden. I have a friend in Sweden who says that the politicians are running now with the Nazi platform uh, and are not hiding it. Uh, is this frightening to you? I, I mean, this is the question about concrete. How do you fight it? Because it's, it's, it's almost like hearkening back to Nazi Germany. The, the rhetoric is the same rhetoric that's coming up. Well, I, I think that one of the things that Paulo taught us is that you know, historical memory is crucial in understanding the problems that we face in the present. And I, and I think that what we need to do is to look back, not only at history, 
uh, not only the history of fascism in Germany and, 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 so, and Italy and so forth and so on, but also in the United States. I mean, the history of fascism might begin with the Ku Klux Klan, if not slavery itself. And so we need to understand how those forces work, how they become operative, and how they become normalized. That's really the issue. But I think, look, I, I want to sort of translate your question in, in a very different way. You know, the issue here is often one in which we talk about the rise of economic and authoritarian nationalism and how that's producing, uh, you know, fascist movements all over the world. I'm less interested in that argument than I am in the global reach that these groups have yeah. and their ability to talk to each other and their ability to work outside of actually the, the boundaries of nationalism in the name of economic nationalism and ideological nationalism and political nationalism and cultural nationalism. Yeah. So it seems to me that what we have is a global movement here that simply uses economic nationalism as a prop to mobilize, miseducate people, and to organize people into the logic of fascism. And I think that the left needs to learn from this. The left needs to learn about what it means to be part of an international movement. The left, ne left needs to learn about what it means to make education center to politics. It needs to learn something about what I would call the productive nature of education in raising a kind of national consciousness that can generate an international movement in which we can fight these forces. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, we have a question for uh, Professor Darter. Um, the question comes from uh, South America and they're asking, what would Freire say about the horrific immigration problem we have here in the United States with the anti-Latin uh, push and, and the, the dis dismantling of our asylum program? Uh, you know, I know it's a big question, but if you could just respond shortly so others can chime in as well. Yeah. <clears throat> I think that, that in the same way that you know, Paula would say that education is political, right? You would say that uh, the borders are political, that, that we can't think about these borders as somehow just coming, you know, suddenly arising in some kind of a vacuum. <clears throat> they, they are a result of a politics. I mean, if we look at Trump's move, you know, to build the wall and in many ways, what Henry just talked about in terms of a kind of economic nationalism and miseducation of people, all of these elements were at work in, in fomenting um, a, a part of the population who was calling for build the wall, build the wall, you know. To, and it essentially is a, a question that has to do with the keeping out of others. But the interesting thing, ex especially with respect to the, the Mexican border, you know, is that people have been crossing borders whether it's whether it's in the in in you know between Mexico and, and the U.S. and other borders around the world, people people are always on the move. So it's it, it's it, it's interesting for us to really understand the movement of people and how it's facilitated or obstructed within the political context and the motivations, the political motivations of nation states, and it's generally large empires that create these these borders that criminalize those who cross those borders. However, as we saw, as we've seen in Mexico and, and um, uh, along the, the Mexican US border, what we found is that those borders become permeable when it's been important to, for economic labor issues. I mean, as a labor a question, economic question, when they wanted um, Mexican um, undocumented workers, the, the, the politics at the border become softened, right. you know, that at the point that, that that begins to change, then you, you begin to see this kind of uh, fomenting of anti-immigrant mm -hmm. attitudes and views, again, a, 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 an ethnocentrism that deeply is pushed against um, immigrants who then are scapegoated in relationship to all the problems that exist. So I, I, I think the question is a deeply political question and, and a deeply economic question. Never, you know, they, these are never separated. So um, I believe that, that when, we, when we want to understand questions of the border, historically, we need to look at the different ways that the political economy of the borders has functioned within a particular context. Thank you. I think that Anita had mentioned, hold on, Donaldo. Anita had mentioned about the issue of nationalism and then Henry's point about neo-fascism and this anti-immigration. It just seems like this is becoming a global conscious movement like Henry talks about in the left and critical pedagogy and 
Henry's work and Paulo's work needs is just so much more relevant to me today. It helps give a language for critique. Uh, but he also was a man of action and a person who talked about activism, like all of you are, are activists in your own right. Um, I would throw this out to Donaldo and Peter and Nita if you want to make a comment about this undercurrent of almost a return to eugenics. Uh, it's like, you know, unbelievable, unbelievable. Sheila? Yes, please. Yeah. No, I just want to, uh, to add something to Antonia that Paolo was so, uh, so forceful in calling to our attention. He says there's always a violence before the violence that gets criminalized, you know, and that what happens, you know, the, the desperation of the immigrants, you know, particularly in the southern border of the United States, you know, had been provoked by the U.S. violence for centuries and decades. You know, one that comes to mind is the, the Rios Monte in Guatemala, where hundreds of thousands of Mayan Indians were basically killed so as to make to make the land available for coffee producers, you know, and other U.S. corporation. And before that, he had, you know, over 30,000 people that in Guatemala, for example, the Indians, again, were were the victims, you know, with the victims. So, you know, uh, uh, the United Fruit Company, you know, Chiquita Banana, mm -hmm. you know, uh, could basically have free land. So in the sense is you create the problem through wars, through the destabilization of the political orientation to sort of basically actually killing of any forces like Allende, for example, there was voted democratically, and there was deposed through by the U.S. support. Thus, so if intellectuals or the peasants and people, working class Chileans, walk all the way to the Mexican border trying to come in, in a sense, they deserve to be in by the mere fact that the U.S. created the condition. Because as an immigrant, I can tell you, no one wants to leave their home to be elsewhere, and you don't even know what the elsewhere is going to be like, and to be further discriminated and suffer under the new reality. You see, so in a sense, we have to, everything that Antonia said and Henry has said and it have said is basically we need to do, the, the, the beauty of Apollo is this invitation, constant invitation for us to do deeper analysis. Yeah. And then if we make those linkages, then we develop a more comprehensive why all of a sudden these, you know, Latinos, you know, uh, Latin Americans, you know, also Brazilians, are basically, you know, quote unquote, flooding. And then, you know, our people find it heroic, you know, to basically, you know, separate children from their mothers, yeah. which at this point there's over 450,000 children that cannot be reconnected with their mothers. You know, there is the most dehumanizing in the 21st century is one of the most dehumanizing act on one hand. On the other hand, we have a president that received 44 million votes, meaning they support that form of dehumanization. Yeah. You see? So these are the things that these linkage that I think Henry earlier was talking about is, is basically what Antonia said, that Paolo is so brilliant in a language that is extremely accessible in a language that alerts us to continue to be vigilant because when we think we've gotten democracy, you know, there, you know, first of all, democracy is not a point of departure or a point where you come from, is a constant, you know, it's a struggle, is a becoming. And, but when we think we're there, you know, we may not be there tomorrow. And we've seen it in Brazil, we've seen it in the United States, for a you know very brief period on January six, you know we didn't know what was going to happen in in, in the capital of the United States. So the the kitchen are coming home to roost. I think Peter's going to jump in now, right, Pete? You got to unmute. Yeah, yeah. No, that's powerful. What Donaldo was saying. I what what's really interested me and in what I've been writing about in in this past year 
has basically been the occult roots of, of the neo-fascism fascism we're experiencing. We have a conflation now of um, anti-vaccine folks, uh, anti-mask folks uh, embodied in this cult, which is called QAnon. And it, you know people laugh at it, but the power of QAnon uh, uh, to uh, basically, you know, percolate uh, through the politics uh, in the United States and other countries is something that really needs to be examined, yeah. um, you know, which embodies a kind of ethno-nationalism, white supremacy, uh, and it basically works like this. If uh, you talk about systemic racism, then you're a racist, right? that whatever you critique, they translate as, well, that's what you are, you know? Yeah. If you critique w a white supremacy, then you're a white supremacist. That's how the logic is working now. And, uh, you know, we have Fox News in the United States. We've got people like Tucker Carlson, which are actually promoting white supremacy and ethno-nationalism. Yeah. And it's powerful. It has occult roots. Um, you know, it's... Um, it's a conglomeration of, again, you know, the QAnon uh, conspiracy, which is ridiculous, which su suggests that the Democrats uh, are pedophiles uh, that kill children yeah. um, during satanic rituals. Right. So and it's, it's like it's what Henry Ray said. But it's, 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 it's massive. I know it's certainly massive in California. Go ahead, Henry. Um, I want to say a couple of things in, re in response to these last few answers. First of all, the real issue we're dealing with is neoliberal capitalism. Let's, let's be clear about this. I mean, I think these individual issues are important, whether it's immigration or otherwise, but they've really got the need, they need to be connected in some fundamental way. You know, Adorno said, if you really want to talk about fascism, you need to talk about capitalism. And, I, and, it's, and it seems to me that what we're dealing with, it, which is a thread that runs across all of these issues, is a massive degree of economic inequality, massive degrees of economic inequality, which translate basically, to say the very least, into political inequalities. And so whether we talk about the border or whether we talk about immigrants, we have to recognize that neoliberalism has basically exhausted itself in terms of its ideologies. Yeah. It can no longer make, it can no longer appeal to the promises that it once made about lifting people up by their bootstraps and so forth and so on. And so what it's now turned to, it's adopted a white supremacist argument in order to divert attention away from the basic failures of neoliberalism. This, we, this has to be understood as an incredibly powerful political project. And so it, it, it seems to me, we then have to ask ourselves, what's the end point here? Well, the end point is not racial cleansing, it's genocide. Yeah. So the stakes that we're dealing with are a lot more than about simply borders and a lot, which are, of course are crucial, a lot more than simply ripping children from their, from their parents, which is crucial. It's the larger issue. I mean, you have populations now being convinced as white supremacists that the public sphere is only acceptable to white people that the only way in which citizens ma citizenship matters is if you're white. That the only logic of democracy and what it means to be an informed citizen is based on the question of racial exclusion. So we're back to the 30s. And it seems to me, unless we learn that history and we learn how to fight that, and we learn to recognize that these normalizing assumptions about who's, who, for instance, about poverty, about who's, who, you know, the failures of, of, of politics with respect is any of his saying, you know, to really provide food and to provide public access to health care. All of these are linked to the failure of capitalism. But capitalism has now taken on an unapologetic position pedagogically, as Paulo would say, that now justifies itself by uh, virtually an un- apologetic acceptance of white supremacy. Yeah. White supremacy is now the enemy of justice all over the world. Last issue. I don't see how we can talk about political rights or social rights unless we talk about economic rights. Political rights and social rights are meaningless without economic rights. If you're poor and all you're involved in is the logic of survival, who cares if you can vote or not? You think anybody cares about that? You think you really have time to read Tukun or, or Counterpunch or Truthout? When, when you're starving, 
And, and, and so I, I think that these basic conditions of humanity, which deprive people of their sense of agency, we're talking about a crisis of politics that's not matched by a crisis of ideas. That's the fundamental problem that we're facing today. That's the fundamental strength of fascism. So, sorry, I, I just needed to say that. No, it's brilliant, really. Uh, Nita, did you want to chime in here? Nita, did you want to say something? Sobre o encontro é, é para finalizar? Sim. Sim. Ok. É, eu quero agradecer de estar participando. Não, não é agradecer porque eu estou participando, é agradecer porque vocês tomaram a iniciativa de, de festejar meu marido Paulo Freire. Eu, I want, I want to really thank all of you uh, for inviting me to participate, but not because I'm participating, but because you are truly celebrating my husband. É, quero agradecer as falas de vocês. I want to thank I want to thank all the speakers for their talks. A fala de Antônia, a fala de Jiru, a fala de Pita, a fala da Sheila. E aí, sem querer causar ciúmes em vocês, eu quero agradecer sobretudo a fala de Eni. Uh, I want to thank, you know, Henry Stock, Peter Stock, Sheila Stock, well, without, uh, without, you know, causing jealousy among you, you know, I want to highlight and, and thank uh, Ini for her talk. É. Ini, ela mostrou toda a exuberância da brasilidade. Yeah. Yeah. Ao... Yeah. yeah, she she was exuberant in exemplifying what it means Brazilian. Yes. And then she also highlighted some important points that uh, with which you know we are we must be contending with in this you know right wing you know uh, uh, government that we have. Quero agradecer a vocês que mencionaram sempre a minha presença, todos vocês mencionaram a presença de Paulo junto a mim e a minha junto a ele. Então, de um modo muito, muito forte, muito especial, muito profundo, eu agradeço a Donaldo Macedo, que, além de tudo, se prestou a ser meu tradutor. <laughs> yeah. uh, I want to thank you because all of you, one way or the other, you you basically celebrated Paulo's presence, but you celebrated that presence in conjunction with my presence in this panel. You know, you all refer to us, not to him only, and uh, and and in a general way, I want to give a special thanks to Donaldo Macedo. In addition to his talk, he also, you know, uh, serve as my, my translator. Lovely, lovely. Muito obrigada. Very, so, thank you much. <laughs> Anybody else want to make a comment before we leave? No, everybody's good? Uh, didn't, did you have your hand up, Nina? No? You're all set? It's all set, right? Antonia. Um, Antonia, do you want to make a goodbye comment? <laughs> I can't hear you? Okay. Um, well, I just want to thank this wonderful panel. Uh, sorry about the beginning. We had a little bumpy ride. Um, I do want to approach all of you at some point in the future to do an individual uh, YouTube interview. Um, I think it's important to hear all of your ideas and certainly um, some of the things that were brought up today uh, are just so moving to me, and I just appreciate the fact that I call you colleagues and friends. So 
Thank you all very much. Take care. Thank bye you. bye. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye, Anita. Bye bye, bye Antonia. Thank you. Thank bye. you all. Bye, Peter. Henry. Bye. -bye. Take care. Denise, thank you. Obrigada. Muito obrigada. Thank you. Você ouviu o que eu falei sobre você, não? Tudo bem. Obrigada, Anitta. Precisamos acabar aquele diálogo, né? Para pro... publicar. Sim, sim. Muito obrigada. Obrigada a você. It was wonderful. Thank you all. Thank you. Great job, Sheila. Oh, great job to you guys. You guys are just so moving and, and yeah. really just historical. Historical. I think it's important. I just, uh, I just can't thank you enough. It was wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Now go take a nap. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> Donaldo, meu abraço a você. Um abraço enorme.